Hi, this is Dan. And today we're going to be talking about screenwriting and how to choose what kind of project you should do. And in fact, what we're going to be doing is talk about the writing process in general. And this will be an ongoing series where uh, every once in a while I'll come in and, and, and talk a little bit more. Now, part of this is because I'm redesigning a couple of my classes. So this is very helpful to me too. But I, I do feel that there are certain fundamentals in the entertainment industry that do not change. And one of them is the importance of a good script. And this is going to become especially more important now that we're seeing a realignment within the industry again, away from the packages, away from the PowerPoint presentations and going once, looking once more at how important content is. In the past, there used to be this mantra that said that content was king. And it seems to me that over the past several years, that that particular mantra has been more or less ignored in favor of let's do a remake, let's do a reboot, let's do something that already has a pre-sold audience so we don't have to worry about making sure the writing is great. That never works long term for a very long time. And in fact, it leads to degradation of genre. Now, I'm not saying anything about genres degrading, but I am kind of hinting that the days of just slapping a Marvel or a DC um, moniker on something might not be enough to guarantee an enormous return on investment, or at least a return on investment that goes above and beyond uh, middle of the road projections. Now, over the weekend, I went to a Greater Los Angeles Writer Society uh, event, and the Greater Los Angeles Writer Society is a gathering and, and a networking group of a bunch of people who want to be in the writing business. Most of it is books, most of it is literary, but over the years, there has been an increasing focus on screenwriting. And I ended up handling a couple of sessions and taking pitches from people. And I even taught a little mini workshop on how to do an actual pitch. And one of the things that I noticed was many writers don't have any idea how to define themselves. So let's talk about that first. And this is all part of, of my concept of feeling that as someone who's a creative, whether you are in development, whether you're a producer, no matter what, you're always, you're always going to backward engineer your project. And what does backward engineering your project mean? It means rather than waiting for the muse to come and sprinkle you with pixie dust and tell you what it is that, that you will write next and, and, and allowing the creative juices to just flow naturally, there's a lot of people for whom that doesn't work, that that, that leads to writer's block, producer's block, director's block, actor's block, where, where you suddenly find yourself not really able to strategize your career because you're allowing perfectionist energy to take over. So let's talk a little bit about what some of the core tenets of backward engineering your project is. The very first of them is to fully analyze what your sweet spot is. What is your game? Now, being in development, having worked for an agent uh, during my internship, and now we're going back a long time, but one of the important things was uh, that I always understood that there was a link between what you were creating and how you needed to get it out there. I was very fortunate that my first employer was in fact a pair of writers who were wildly successful in getting things at least optioned. And uh, one of those writers, in fact, not only wrote movie scripts, but he also wrote poetry, he also wrote books, and he won the National Book Award at one point. So we're, we're talking about people who were very, very, very prolific. So this is, in general, what the entertainment industry looked like then. And I know that there's this feeling that the past has nothing to do with the present. That is perhaps one of the most idiotic things anyone ever said. But at that time, when content is king was the ruling, was, was the ruling thesis, when you were an independent uh, production company, and that's where I started. I started an independent production company before I worked in television and became an executive at, at the company now known as Fremantle Media. But uh, I, I was vice president of development there, just in case anyone wonders. 
So yes, I've got a little bit of credibility in this in this realm. What we would always talk about is what kind of writer someone was. And you can extrapolate that into what kind of an actor, what kind of a director, what kind of a producer you are. And that is what is your sweet spot? Now, we don't often talk about that in academia or or in the science of screenwriting. Instead, we 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 tend to follow um, either the Joseph Campbell rules or the Aristotelian rules about about structure and 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 focusing on that. But if you look at how agents categorize their writers, if you look at how uh, development people talk about them, even though this might not be something that they that they write on the board or even are aware of their doing, you usually split uh, creative talent into one of three categories. The first of those categories is someone who is good with story. And what does being good with story mean? Well, first of all, if you're an instructor, it makes teaching writing fairly easy because most of the books that are written on how to write a screenplay are based on the angle of someone who is good with story. And the reason for that, and this isn't nefarious, it just is, is that it's much easier to teach a story-oriented writer how to write something that's commercial. So, and I'm talking about everything from Save the Cat to the Sid Field book, which I was unfortunate enough to have to deal with back when I was in film school, to the David Trottier book, uh, which which is a really good one. I, I I prefer the Trottier book to any of the others. Robert McKee wrote some more, but 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 by and large, these are all books that stress the importance of structure, of making sure you understand three part dramatic structure, that you have three acts. The first act is approximately thirty pages. The second act is approximately 60 pages, and the third act is approximately 30 pages again. Now, I know that sounds confusing. Why isn't it broken into quarters? Well, you know what, secretly, in the way it's it's generally taught now, it wasn't taught this way 35 years ago, but it, but it is now, is that you actually divide the second act in half with what is known as a key scene. And what ends up happening is when you are a story-oriented writer, you're very comfortable with building your screenplay or anything that you write around the plot, that there are certain things, there are certain mechanics that make your, uh, that, that, that give your character a plot goal, what is their want, uh, versus their need, which is their theme goal. And they are in conflict with that throughout. And um, within that, you have certain key points in, in your storytelling. Now, while this is very good for people who are comfortable with that, it also has a negative side. And that negative side is that this is very disciplined. This lands towards someone who has a creative is very disciplined, that you write an outline. Oh, first you do your note cards or however you do it now. You do your note cards and, and, and then you do your treatment and then you do your long outline, your step outline where you go over every single scene and each of the scenes has its own little uh, dynamic that you must have in it. Well, I got to tell you, that while this works for a significant number of writers, for another number of writers, this looks like a big math problem. So what it can do is it can cause people who are perhaps less, this is gonna sound negative, but it's not, who are less disciplined in their summoning of the muse to block, or it makes it easier for them to block. It makes it easier for them to dive into perfectionist energy. Nevertheless, this style of writing is key to a large number or a large amount of content that is popular throughout most of the Western world. And that is that this is the basis for many um, procedural type movies, like a, like a detective mystery. It's also very good for one hour dramas on television, even though I know now that the, the, this, this whole 
this whole model is is kind of torn up and they're they're trying to reassert it. But even in something that's a limited series of six to 10 episodes or something that's a limited series that might go for years, like Stranger Things, you still have it oriented around cliffhangers. You have it oriented around big act changes and you have it oriented around the story driving you along with its momentum. Now you might say, what other kind of writers are there? The second kind of writer, and this is ironic because this kind of writer, at least at times when sitcoms are wildly popular, is a character-oriented writer. And what does that mean? That means that your story leads with your characters, your main character in particular, their foibles, their little eccentricities, their little um, habits that drive everyone around them crazy, but at the same time, make them lovable to audiences. Now, what ends up happening, if you are very strongly character oriented, you might find your character actually at a certain point starts talking to you. And when your character starts talking to you, heaven forbid you try to fit them in a three-part dramatic structure. Oh, no, no, you have to have your inciting incident coming up. Oh, no. This is time for you to hit your key scene. And, and your character says, I want to do that. And, and, and you find yourself almost battling with them. Um, if you look at a lot of dramas or plays that are comedies uh, uh, or, that, that, or, or plays, you'll notice that many of them also kind of sort of don't really follow three-part dramatic structure. It's almost as if the act breaks and, and, and whatever story there is, is nothing more than a coat hanger on which to highlight character insight. Now, we might think, oh, well, that, that doesn't sound like it's fully professional. Well, let's put it this way. Sitcoms, all the way since the Mary Tyler Moore show became very separated from the situation and became much more oriented with the comedy. And that comedy was coming up with the reason for people to get into a room together and fuss. Look at your average Neil Simon play. Don't you find that your average Neil Simon play, yes, it does have a quote unquote story, but that story is often very weak compared to the amount of enjoyment we get from the way the characters interact with each other. And, and, and so in honesty, being character oriented means that you could be among the highest paid writers and still have a problem with being 100% comfortable with three-part dramatic structure. I'm not saying you won't have it, but you, you will probably find it more constraining than, than just being able to write all of these different character details. And please remember that a lot of the, these, these, these movies tend to be the ones that people can watch over and over and over again because there's moments in them where where we find the characters role modeling and 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 so being character oriented means that if you are trying to write for a class that you might be faced with some challenges do what you need to do to get the grade but ultimately please remember that it is your little details of character, your little moments that are going to make a performer say, I want to do this role. And it won't be, I want to do this role because it's going to pay me a lot of money. No, they're going to want to do this role because it allows them to stretch as an actor. And in the process of doing that, this is how a lot of these character oriented movies, which can be done for less money, can end up being very nice box office hits. Let me give you an example of a recent, well, it's not that recent, but a fairly recent character-oriented movie that did sensationally, and that's Hidden Figures. Now, note that Hidden Figures does indeed have somewhat of a three-part dramatic structure, but when we think of that movie, don't we think more of those moments when characters were faced with a situation and our interest in it was highlighted by how they dealt with it? That's what we took away from it. That's what being character oriented is. So if you find yourself in a situation where let's say you're in a writer's group and you find people being very hard on you 
because they don't feel your story is hitting all of its right marks uh, in terms of structure. You might need to find a different writer's group where they're more focused on character because that is your belly wick. And yes, there are certain challenges that, that make someone whose structure is a little bit off, a little bit harder to hire. But let me tell you something. When you're dealing in the world of producers and development execs, what we're in the business of looking for is magic. And this is why, by the way, it's very difficult to teach screenwriting from the perspective of being character oriented, because how do you teach magic? It either happens or it doesn't. So, so if you find yourself more in this field, be aware that a lot of development people will focus on, oh my God, they had this magical line. They had this magical scene. We can actually build an entire movie out of this bit of character, this, this insight. Again, oh, think about the movie Moonstruck. The movie Moonstruck, which kind of was the capstone of Cher's dramatic career. I mean, everything in her career led up to it, all the way from good times and chastity and all that, to come back to the five and dime Jimmy D, to this moment where she was able to win her Academy Award for Best Actress and prove that she could do it. And what was the key scene in that? When she is waking up after having fallen in love with Nicolas Cage, um, he says, you know, I'm in love with you. And she slaps, smacks him and says, snap out of it. A moment of reality, a moment that we would never have guessed would have come out of her at the beginning of the movie and so real and combined with all the other real little bit of character insights like that allowed you to forget that this movie's kind of sloppy in terms of its structure because you were so caught up in all of the people that you had come to love. The third type of creator is someone who is scene oriented. And now scene orientation drives every single instructor in cinema insane. And the reason is because this relies on magic almost more than anyone else. And, and, and what it means is that you have something that has neither that strong a story and structure nor a very good character, but it has a lot of memorable scenes. And in case you think, oh my God, that sounds like a terrible movie. Can we point out that almost every big tentpole movie is scene oriented, even though Top Gun Maverick has a ton of stuff in it that's very good with character and very role modeling and very heartwarming. It's still very based on those spectacular moments. The, the character development, the, the, the story arc in it is very secondary to those moments when you feel your heart racing, when you're, you're sensing that you are there. Look at the, the successful Marvel movies, especially something like, like, like the Avengers movies, uh, especially Avengers Endgame. Look at how well-crafted each individual scene is. Now, the movie itself, in terms of its structure, it's okay, but it definitely goes off and meanders in all sorts of different directions. And in terms of character, a lot of times the characters are more types, and, and we fortunately have very good star persona behind them, and that makes them come alive. Hence, when we see some of the more recent Marvel movies that have had a little bit of problem. It's not only because the audiences aren't familiar with the characters, it's because the characters aren't necessarily engaging yet. And part of that, while I don't like to blame the actor it's, uh, or, or, or the star personas in them, it's, it's that they're not, they're not getting the magic. So, so that's why they're not connecting the way that, that, that they should have. We're, 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 we're almost supposed to admire them as opposed to love them. And ad admiration carries with it the same danger that pity does. And, 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 and that is, it goes hand in hand just a bit with negative emotions. 
with pity, there's also contempt. With admiration, there's a little bit of envy or jealousy. And because because they're doing stuff that's superhuman and 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 not quite believable. And this can even be in something like a buddy cop movie. By the way, buddy cop movies are absolutely scene oriented, like you wouldn't believe. So uh, and 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 there's entire genres based around this. Most key of those is horror movies. In a horror movie, if your story is too well structured, guess what? There's not that discomfort among the audience thinking, I really don't know what's going to happen next, and I'm really angry about it. Think about Psycho when they kill Janet Lee in the shower. Uh, it's 60 years old. Stop it. Um, so, uh, spoiler. Anyway, um, when they did that, memorable scene, violated good structure, violated good character, violated good storytelling. That's what made it work, right? And moreover, when you have a character that's too likable in a horror movie and you kill them, you can run into problems. Look at what Alfred Hitchcock discovered early in his career when he made a movie called Sabotage. There's this little kid in it and there's this really suspenseful scene where he's on a bus and he's carrying a bomb and he doesn't know he's carrying a bomb. He plays with a dog next to him and all of that. And then the bomb goes off and he's killed. Audiences didn't like that because they'd grown to love him. Much better that you have a type, particularly a type you might not even like. Like when you look at the last girl movies, most of the time, the last girl is the only one who has any sort of real character development. Everyone else is a type. And therefore, when, when they become fodder for the insane person, there's a little bit of schadenfreude about this, where, where you're not... You're more interested in the spectacle of the murder. Another genre that relies a lot on scenes is musicals, where when you have a production number breakout and, and it's in the middle of a story that you're really involved with on a dramatic level, I'm going to present it. I'm going to say something here that's really a, a little controversial. A lot of the Rodgers and Hammerstein and big musicals of the past and even the new variation on West Side Story suffer greatly because the book's too strong. And what happens today when we don't have a, a general history of musical theater where there's always musicals coming out, when we see a musical where we're involved in the story, like, like we are in West Side Story, when it goes into a number, there's just that little bit of a sense that the number is an intrusion. Rather than the emotional context being brought out by the songs, we are now feeling, okay, I'm going to turn off my brain and watch the spectacle. And I'm, I'll be honest with you, there's a, there's a part of me that's fearing that this is starting to happen in a lot of the very big tentpole pictures where you start launching into a big battle scene and there's just a little bit of a sense in the audience where they're sitting back and going, okay, now impress me because I know this is going to go on for 20 minutes. That's the first sign that a, that a genre might be heading toward decadence. So we're going to, we're going to put a pin in this right now and see if, if maybe this kind of tentpole superhero movie might be kind of coming to the end of this particular version of its cycle. Don't worry, it'll circle around again. Um, so, so that scene orientation, of course, the great director of this is Alfred Hitchcock. I mean, he was known to start with a location and then backward engineer the character out of the location. Who's the least likely person to be on Mount Rushmore? New York businessman, right? Not, not, a, not a ranger, not someone who knows about mountain climbing. No, you're going to have a businessman who's very twee. That's the person who's going to be hanging there. Why is he hanging there? And then you back the story out of that. So that's scene orientation. Now, whether you're a writer, whether you're a director, whether you're a producer, whether you're a performer, if you're aware that your particular niche is one of these, and you will also have combinations of all of these elements. Trust me, the average really, really successful person in the above the line world is very good at at least two of these things, if not all three. There's very few who are good at all three, by the way. But, but, the, but you'll usually have at least be good at two of them. And, 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 and that's what part of defining who you are as a creative 
becomes becomes key. Secondarily to that, you next look at who is buying your style. And when we do the next one of these, we'll go into that just a little bit more. But remember, the reason I'm going over some of these ideas is not only because I'd love you to join my class, but it's because for you to be the best talent that you can possibly be, knowing your strength will allow you to focus on what you're good at. And unlike what my grandmother, Grandma Kalpucci, would always say, oh, you know, good, you, you, you know how to do multiple things, be good, many things. Perhaps one of the few lessons that she gave me that might not have been correct. Instead, I take the other extreme. And I say, if you're really, really good at something, focus on that. And rather than obsess over something you're less good at, only focus on what you're great at. Worry about the other stuff, maybe with a writing partner or in your next life, if the need be. This was my excuse for saying, since 1981, I haven't taken a math class because I'm not good at math. Yeah, I'm Asian and I'm not good at math. And what kind of a big confession is that? So um, I stopped focusing on math. I focused on what I was good at, which is being a complete geek about movie stuff. I ended up vice president of a national corporation. So that could happen to me. I'm telling you, it happened to you. Have you never been better? Have you never tried?